there is one type of vulnerability, one vulnerability class that has yielded me easily a couple dozen high and critical findings to this date. And actually, nobody really talks about it. So today, I'm going to go through and introduce, okay, what is this mysterious one vulnerability class that nobody really talks about, yet is still a finding that comes up again and again and again. And then we're gonna have a look at some examples of this finding actually coming up in some basic code bases. And then we'll see the heuristics that you can use to uncover these findings for yourself. So of course, before I reveal what this type of vulnerability class is, this mysterious vulnerability, of course, my name is Owen and over around two years ago, I founded Guardian Audits. And ever since then, we've uncovered dozens and dozens and dozens and even really hundreds of high and critical vulnerabilities in smart contract systems. And at this point, I've probably spent, you know, maybe 3000 or 4000 hours or so auditing smart contracts. And the reason I make all of these videos and put them out is to share all of that experience and everything I've learned along the way with you so that you can ultimately become a much, much better smart contract auditor, blockchain developer in a fraction of the time. So with that out of the way, let's get into this one vulnerability class that nobody talks about. Okay, so of course, we have the whiteboard of truth and justice, the whiteboard of Web3 security pulled up here. So let's go ahead and reveal what is the vulnerability class that nobody talks about. So of course, it is stepwise jumps. So I never hear anybody talk about stepwise jumps. And yet, Every time I see a stepwise jump occurring in a protocol, it pretty much always, almost always, I'd say maybe 85% of the time ends up in a high or critical finding. And if it doesn't, usually it's going to be a medium. So stepwise jumps are pretty much always a bad thing in DeFi protocols. So first of all, you might be asking, what is a stepwise jump? And why is it so bad? So first, let's understand what is a stepwise jump. So we'll go ahead and let's draw out like a, a basic timeline. Let's say we are plotting out the, in the most simple case, the value of a vault over time. So let's say we've got the, the V for the value of the vault. And then obviously time is on the X axis here. And then, so let's say we've got a, uh, just a flat valuation for a vault. And then all of a sudden in this T equals two, let's say there's some sort of reward compound or something like this. And in this single block in block number two, the value of the vault jumps up and it does so in a stepwise fashion. And then after that, it will continue on at a flat valuation. So this right here is a stepwise jump. And the reason this is bad is because this stepwise jump here in this particular example can be directly exploited. Now, sometimes in some cases they aren't maybe directly exploitable, not so flagrant as this, but this is the most simple case. And what we can do is we can deposit into the vault as a malicious user, deposit in the vault right before that T equals two stepwise jump in the value of the vault. And then right after we can withdraw and we get all of the benefit for being in the vault. If let's say we were in the vault from t equals zero to t equals four, we would have gotten the same exact rewards as somebody who was right here. And they could have even done this in the same block. They would have a transaction that comes before the reward compound, then the reward compound happens, and then a transaction right after the reward compound. And so this malicious user was never actually in the vault for an entire like singular block but they still reaped all of the rewards, the same amount of rewards as somebody who was in the vault that had been deposited in the vault from T equals zero to T equals four. And so this right here is at the very least a high finding where somebody can siphon the rewards from all of the other depositors in the vault and they will get paid to do so. 
And so, of course, the worst case of this, the worst exploitation of a stepwise jump in this particular scenario is front running and back running the stepwise jump. This is just one way in which stepwise jumps can be exploited. We'll have a look in a bit at some other more interesting ways that stepwise jumps hide in protocols and can ultimately cause veritable issues for protocols. And they might not look exactly like this. So you just have to keep your eyes open and know when you see something that it is a stepwise jump and that you can turn it into a finding. So first of all, if maybe you're not entirely familiar with front running and back running, then go ahead and check out my front running and sandwich attacks videos. Those will be down in the description below. So we're gonna discuss now three different ways that stepwise jumps can commonly come up and lead to a finding in a protocol. So first of all, let's have a look at exactly something just like this. And let's have a look at the first one, which is reward compounds. And so for this, I've got a basic stake finance protocol here pulled up. And we can see this is a very simple protocol for users to stake their USDC and receive the reward token from donations. So we've got stake finance V1 here. And we can see some of the functions here. We've got a stake, unstake, claim rewards, donate, and update rewards here going on. So if I just want to get an understanding of this protocol, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk the user flows of this contract and I'm gonna see, okay, so a user can stake. Let's see what's going on there. We're going to take USDC from the message sender, bring it into this address, and then it looks like we're gonna grab a user stake storage. We're going to update any rewards. We'll look at that in a second. But basically we're just going to increase the user stake dot amount which is the amount that they staked and then also be tracking the total stake cool so let's check out unstake unstake looks like it will do basically just the opposite where we're going to subtract the user staked amount subtract the total staked amount and then transfer it to the message sender with the amount here so now let's have a look at update rewards let's see what's going on here so we can see we're using a reward per share pattern if the reward per share had been zero, then we're going to assign it to whatever the current reward per share is. We'll calculate what the pending rewards are if they had a non-zero reward per share with the reward per share, the current global reward per share subtracted by whatever the user had on their stake st struct here. And then we multiply that on, so rewards per share, the difference in the reward per share times the amount of shares, the user staked amount, that gives you the total pending rewards. And then we will update the user's reward per share that their struct is stamped with and then increase the amount of rewards that the user has. So, okay, I've got a, a decent idea of stake and unstake now. Now let's have a look at claim rewards. So I can see, of course, we're gonna update the rewards before we claim them. We wanna be claiming the most recent rewards. Then we're gonna cache what the, that reward amount is zero it out in storage before we actually go ahead and do the transfer and give the reward amount to the user. So great, that all makes sense. And then let's have a look at donate, which is presumably how rewards actually enter the system. So we're gonna take the reward token and we're gonna grab it from whoever is calling donate. We're gonna donate the specified amount. This is how we increase the reward per share and facilitate distributing that amount of donated reward tokens across all of the stakers by you know dividing it between the total stake so there is a high impact vulnerability a high impact bug here that is going to affect the stakers of this protocol can you see it and can you recognize it well it has to do with this function here this donate function and this is causing in a single transaction a increment in the reward per share that looks something like this. So if we had our reward per share here on this axis, so reward per share, so we've got reward per share on this Y axis, then exactly this, if I call the donate function at T equals two, then we will get this stepwise jump in reward per share. It will increase by whatever this amount is divided by the total stake in that single transaction. And so this is exactly, this donate function is creating a stepwise jump 
in the system. And it can be exploited or arbitraged in the same exact way that we just discussed. So somebody can front run that transaction, stake right before it, and when they stake right before it, they will update rewards. They'll get stamped with whatever the previous reward per share is. And then they can go and afterwards, they can unstake right after the donate call. And so we, we go to unstake, we will update the rewards, and we will see that, okay, the donate increased the reward per share versus what we were just stamped with. And so this is that delta multiplied by the amount. So we get whatever rewards we could just flood this staking contract with a ton of staked USDC. And so if there was previously a hundred staked USDC, if I go and I stake a thousand USDC, now I'm taking 90% of the rewards because now I have virtually all of the staked amount and that is getting added and accounted for my rewards here. And then I can come and I can claim those rewards with the claim function. And I only had to stake and then unstake in like a period of a single block. I just sandwiched that transaction to donate with staking and unstaking. And so this is negatively impacting every other staker in the system, right? Because they were the rightful owners to this donation since they had been the ones who were staking all along. And so this is very easily a high impact finding. I would personally rank it a high severity finding, although there is even an argument for a critical finding here. And of course, this is pretty much the most simple case of this kind of a stepwise jump manipulation, but this is exactly something that comes up in so, so many code bases, you would be surprised. And we can see exactly here in a real audit report that we have completed. You can check out our, our key finance audit report here in our, in our GitHub under the guardian audits slash audits repository. So we've got stake one here, reward compounds are sandwichable. And this is exactly this vulnerability. So we can see the description here says there exists no fee or lockup period associated with staking to receive a portion of the rewards compounded during the update all rewards for transfer receiver and transfer fee function. Essentially, that is a really long name for a function that just compounds rewards. It increases the amount of rewards that are owed to stakers. And there's nothing to keep you from just staking right before that function is called and unstaking right afterwards. And so that's exactly what we describe here. A malicious actor may simply buy GMX key and stake it right before that function gets called to immediately accrue a portion of the collected rewards that were meant to be attributed to other stakers. And then the malicious actor can then immediately claim these rewards, unstake and sell all of their staked GMX key after the reward compound and therefore basically stealing rewards from other stakers. So this is in this report a high severity finding and yes this does come up again and again and again in even just this most basic format but now let's talk about a few more complex less easy to spot types of stepwise jumps and to do that let's have a look at stake finance v2 so the stake finance team has gone back to the drawing board they see okay all right there is an issue with that reward per share model and so we're going to change it to a reward rate model where instead of distributing immediately when somebody donates, we are going to just assign ourselves a rate per second in which rewards are distributed. And then this way, instead of the graph looking like this, we're going to have a graph that looks smooth and it looks like this in terms of rewards. It goes straight up and it might... It might reach the same point, but instead of taking a stepwise jump to get there, it takes a straight line. And this way, even if you, let's say you stake right here, and then you unstake right here, well, you're only getting the delta from where you staked and unstaked, which is always going to be small if you're trying to do it within like a two or three block period. So you're never going to be able to actually go ahead and siphon these rewards by you know front running or back running anything so let's have a quick walkthrough of this contract let's see how the user flows work out here 
And then let's have a look and see if we can find the stepwise jump in this protocol. So the stake function here is mostly the same. You see we've just added like a, a max staked amount check we are transferring from just like we, we were, increasing the user stake amount, increasing the total stake. We will look at update rewards in a second. And then an unstake, it looks like we are doing pretty much exactly the same thing. Now, if we go into update rewards, we can see now instead of a reward per share, we're using a last updated app. And so if this is equal to zero, we're going to assign it to the current block dot timestamp. If it's not equal to zero, meaning that you had an already existing stake, this isn't your first time staking, then we're going to get the time since you updated. So this will be the, the current block dot timestamp minus the user stake that, that you were stamped with. And we're going to calculate the pending rewards based on the time. So the time times the reward rate. And the reward rate here is a per share per second rate of reward tokens that should be distributed. So per token that you have staked per second, this is how many rewards should be distributed. So that's what we're calculating here. We're adding those to the user's rewards and then we're updating the last updated app for the user's stake. So right here, this is where we're basically facilitating this smooth line of as time passes, that is that determines how much rewards you get by affecting this time since updated. And we've got the smooth line of rewards over time. Let's see what else do we have that is new in this contract. Well, of course, we've got uh, a function here to set the maximum stake amount, which is only owner, and then a, a new function to set the reward rate, which is also the only owner. So at this point, I'm claiming that we have seen a stepwise jump somewhere in this contract. So maybe pause the video here and we will, I guess I'll scroll through here. Can you tell me where where is the stepwise jump in this contract? Go ahead and, and pause the video and see if you can find it. Okay, so if your answer has to do with this set reward rate function, then I think you've got it. Now, this is a really tricky one that honestly gets the vast majority of protocols that have some kind of reward rate or some kind of interest rate that is being paid and can be updated by an owner address or something like this, some privileged address. So let's see, where is the stepwise jump here? Well, if we chart out a graph of the reward rate, then we can see that, okay, so the reward rate had been this, maybe it's like 5% per year or something, and then we update it immediately. And I guess what we'll do is we'll, we'll move it up here. And let's say the, the owner reduces it to 4% or 3%, per year. And so in a single transaction where we call set reward rate, we decrease the reward rate by an entire 2% from 5% to 3% in a single transaction. And that is our stepwise jump. And so you might be thinking, well, okay, yes, the reward rate does change in that singular transaction, but what is the issue with that? Well, let's say if I had staked right here for the first time at t equals one, and then over here at t equals five, I have unstaked. Let's see what would happen. So let's go to the stake function. I'm gonna give this amount. I'm gonna save transfer from, we're gonna grab this amount and we're gonna update rewards. And my last update at is zero. This is my first stake. So I'll just get assigned with whatever the, the block dot timestamp is in block number one. And then we'll go ahead and return. Now, next time in block number five here, we're gonna come back, I'm gonna unstake, we'll end up back in this update rewards function, and we will not hit this, we will come here, and I have actually accrued some rewards. So we'll calculate, okay, what is the, the time since updated? We'll get you know this time delta here of this four block period, and then we will read what is the reward rate. Now this is a storage variable, it's just whatever the current reward rate is. The issue here is that we are projecting this current reward rate. So the reward rate from, from right here, we're projecting that over the entire period that I had staked. But in fact, the reward rate had not been assigned to this current value of 3% for the entire period. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, this is what the reward rate is when you're unstaking. 
Cool. So for the entire time since updated, we will treat you as if the reward rate for the entire protocol had been flat like this for this period. But it hadn't. We can see that, in fact, it was higher. It was 5% for a period of time up here. And so we are errantly calculating the pending rewards on a reward rate that was not configured for the majority of the period of time that we were actually staked. And so ultimately what happens here in this case is that we get our rewards valued as if the reward rate had been 3% for the entire time versus the actual amount of rewards that we should have accrued, which was 5% for this period of time and then 3% for this period of time, which would have been more. So in this case, the user loses out on rewards that they should have rightfully claimed. And of course, if the owner had instead reduced, increased the rewards so that the rewards had a stepwise increase, then if this was at 7%, then this is arguably even worse because the user will get more rewards than they should have. We it would have assumed that from block one to block five, the rewards were at 7% the entire time, and that user will get more rewards than they actually should have accrued. And so this is really just a byproduct of the user's pending reward calculation and accounting, taking whatever the current reward rate is and applying it over the entire period, considering if that reward rate had changed at all. So the solution to this, as we saw with the solution to the problem in Stake Finance V1 was to spread out the rewards over a period of time. Well, the solution here is to actually centralize the rewards so that all users are going off of a index or like a, a like we saw in stake finance v1 still using a reward per share that every user is tied to in terms of how much they have accrued but updating that reward per share in a linear time fashion instead of having stepwise jumps in the reward per share and then what we need to do once we're able to increase all of the users rewards by just affecting that one variable, that reward per share, then what we can do is when we go to actually change the reward rate, before we update the reward rate, we need to update everyone's rewards. And we need to make sure that we update everybody's rewards, accounting for whatever the reward rate currently is. So when we do make this jump, we say, okay, cool. We're gonna head up to 7% for the reward rate now I'm going to chop this off. We're going to account for everybody getting rewards at this 5% rate. We're not going to get this accounted for at the 7% rate. And then now moving forward, everything now can accrue at the 7% rate. And so what you'll often see is many, many protocols not changing and updating everybody's rewards and accounting for all of their rewards having occurred at the previous reward rate before actually updating the reward. So anytime you see a set reward rate, set interest rate, or anything like that, any kind of rate that is being set by privileged address or just changing in general, that is often a stepwise jump in disguise that causes some invalid accounting for individual positions. So let's talk about the third and final type stepwise jump vulnerabilities. And of course, the, the third type is an inflation attack. So anytime you see some kind of stepwise jump, you can also create an inflation attack out of that. So the classic example is the vault that relies on balance of to determine how much value one of the vault tokens is. And then of course you can send a ton of tokens to the vault to increase the value, cause a stepwise jump in the, in the value of the vault. And then somebody who is in the mempool attempting to be a depositor will ultimately get rounded down on the amount of vault tokens that they get and they will lose a ton of value and if you want to go really deep on the inflation attacks i have actually a, a complete master class on inflation attacks erc4626 front running attacks where i discuss the three red flags that you need to look for when it comes to uncovering inflation attacks and vault attacks in general, really. And of course, of those three things, one of them is essentially a stepwise jump. So there you have it. There are the three different kinds of stepwise jumps. You have reward compounds and donations, things like that. We have interest rate updates, reward rate updates. And finally, we have inflation attacks and vault accounting attacks. 
relying on balance of. And again, I 100% recommend that if you're not entirely, entirely comfortable with inflation attacks and you don't see how they can apply outside of vault systems, then you should absolutely go and check out our masterclass on inflation attacks. That's in the description below. It's just another YouTube video that you can go ahead and, and watch. And now I hope you can see the, the value in stepwise jumps. And now I hope I can hear more people talking about stepwise jumps as a vulnerability class. So keep your eyes peeled for these kind of stepwise jumps. And anytime you happen to find some kind of stepwise jump, then you know you've probably got a vulnerability. And of course, if you're looking to become a skilled smart contract security researcher, a, a senior smart contract auditor, in a number of months instead of years, then you can go ahead and in the description below, I've got my six step guide to becoming a senior auditor in six months. And that's just everything that I've seen from where I am now. If I were to go back, these are the, the six things that I wish I could just see like, okay, yes, I need to do this. And then I need to do this and do this. And a few things there that would have drastically, honestly sped up my progress to be able to get to where I am now. So if if that's something that's interested to you, it's there. If it's not, then that's totally fine. And of course, if you are really interested in this security stuff and you want to dive deep, you want to connect with other security researchers from across the world, then of course you can go to lab.guardianaudits.com and you can apply to join our absolutely free community of smart contract security researchers and connect with powerful security researchers from across the world. We've got, I think, over a thousand different auditors, security researchers, blockchain developers in there right now. So that is all for this time, and I can't wait to see you in the next one.